In reality, man always lives according to one spirit or another, whether it be according to the spirit of nature, when he does not go beyond practical naturalism, or according to the spirit of faith, when he tends seriously toward his last end, toward heaven and sanctity. The spirit according to which we live is a special manner of considering all things, of seeing, judging, feeling, loving, sympathising, willing and acting. It is a particular mentality or disposition that colours almost all our judgments and acts and communicates to our life its elevation or depression. Consequently, the spirit of faith is a special manner of judging all things from the higher point of view of essentially supernatural faith, which is based on the authority of God revealing, on the veracity of God, author of grace and glory, who by the road of faith wishes to lead us to eternal life. We may better grasp the nature of the spirit of faith by considering the spirit opposed to it, which is a sort of spiritual blindness that enables man to attain divine things, divine things only materially and from without. Thus Israel, the chosen people, did not have a sufficiently spiritual understanding of the privilege which it had received and in which, with the coming of the Saviour, other peoples, called also to receive the divine revelation, were to share. The Jews thought that the bread reserved to the children of Israel should not be given to pagans. Christ reminds us of this way of thinking in the first words he addresses to the woman of Canaan. Then he immediately inspires her with the admirable reply, Yea, Lord, for the whelps also eat of the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. Then Jesus answering said to her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it done to thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was cured from that hour. The spirit of faith which the Jews lacked and this humble woman possessed is the spirit of divine and universal truth. The very object of faith, above any particularism of peoples or human societies. Thus St. Paul, who was at first strictly attached to the synagogue and its prejudices, became the Apostle of the Gentiles. Similarly, the glory of St. Augustine and St. Thomas does not consist in their being the masters of only a group of disciples, but in their being the common doctors of the Church. The spirit of faith can have this universality only because of its eminent simplicity, which is a participation in the wisdom of God. The act of faith, as St Thomas points out, is far above reasoning, a simple act by which we believe at the same time in God revealing and in God revealed. By this essentially supernatural act, we adhere infallibly to God who reveals and to the mysteries revealed. Thus, by this simple act, superior to all reasoning, we tend in obscurity toward the contemplation of divine things above all the certitudes of a natural order. The essentially supernatural certitude of infused faith, as we said before, greatly surpasses the rational certitude that man can have of the divine origin of the gospel through the historical and critical study of the miracles which confirm it. Faith, which is a gift of God, is like a spiritual sense, enabling us to hear the harmony of revealed mysteries or the harmony of the voice of God, before we are admitted to see him face to face. Infused faith is like a superior musical sense, 
enabling us to hear more or less indistinctly the meaning of a mysterious spiritual harmony of which God is the author. St. Paul states the matter clearly. We have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit that is of God, that we may know the things that are given us from God, which things also we speak, not in the learned words of human wisdom, but in the doctrine of the spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the sensual man perceiveth not these things that are of the Spirit of God, for it is foolishness to him, and he cannot understand, because it is spiritually examined. But the spiritual man judgeth all things, and he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 16. For judging in this manner, faith is aided by the gift of understanding, which makes man penetrate the meaning of the mysteries, and by the gift of wisdom, which makes him taste them. But it is faith itself which makes us adhere infallibly to the word of God. The theological virtue of infused faith, in spite of the obscurity of the mysteries, is very superior to the intuitive and very luminous knowledge which the angels possess naturally. Infused faith, in reality, belongs to the same order as eternal life, of which it is like the seed as St. Paul says, it is the substance of things to be hoped for, the basis of our justification. The angels themselves needed to receive this gratuitous gift of God in order to tend to the supernatural end to which they were called. As St. Francis de Sales says in substance, when God gives us faith, he enters our soul and speaks to our spirit, not by way of discourse, but by his inspiration. When faith comes, the soul strips itself of all discourses and arguments and, subjecting them to faith, it enthrones faith on them, recognising it as queen. When the light of faith has cast the splendour of its truths, on our understanding, our will immediately feels the warmth of celestial love. It is important for the sanctification of our souls to remember that faith should daily increase in us. It may be greater in a poorly educated but wholly just man than in a theologian. St. Thomas Aquinas states, a man's faith may be described as being greater in one way on the part of his intellect, on account of its greater certitude and firmness, and in another way on the part of his will, on account of his greater promptitude, devotion or confidence. The reason is that faith results from the gift of grace, which is not equally in all. Thus our Lord says of certain of his disciples that they are still men of little faith, slow of heart to believe. Whereas he said to the woman of Canaan, O woman, great is thy faith. But my just man liveth by faith, and increasingly so. There are holy individuals who have never made a conceptual analysis of the dogmas of the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Eucharist, and who have never deduced from these dogmas the theological conclusions known to all theologians. But in these souls, the infused virtue of faith is far more elevated, more intense than in many theologians. 
Many recent beatifications and canonizations confirm this fact. When we read the life of Saint Bernadette of Lourdes or of Saint Gemma Galgani, we can well exclaim, God grant that I may one day have as great faith as these souls. Theologians say justly that faith may grow either in extension or in depth or in intensity. Our faith is extended when we gradually learn all that has been defined by the Church on the mysteries of the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Eucharist, and the other points of Christian doctrine. Thus theologians know explicitly all that has been defined by the Church. But it does not follow that they have a faith as intense and profound as it is extended. On the contrary, among the faithful, there are saints who are ignorant of several points of doctrine defined by the Church, for example, the redemptive incarnation and the Eucharist, and who penetrate profoundly these mysteries of salvation as they are simply announced in the Gospel. Saint Benedict Joseph Labre, for example, never had occasion to read a theological treatise on the Incarnation, but he lived profoundly by this mystery and that of the Eucharist. The Apostles asked for this faith that is greater in depth and in intensity when they said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And Jesus answered, all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. We shall obtain it especially if we ask perseveringly for ourselves what is necessary or manifestly useful to salvation, like the increase of the virtues. The value of the spirit of faith is measured in trial by the difficulties which it surmounts. St Paul says this eloquently in the epistle to the Hebrews. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, accounting that God is able to raise up even from the dead. By faith he Moses left Egypt, not fearing the fierceness of the king, Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him that is invisible. For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, wrought justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions like Daniel, quenched the violence of fire like the three children in the furnace. And others had trials of mockeries and stripes, moreover also of bands and prisons. They were stoned like Zachary. They were cut asunder like Isaiah. They were tempted. They were put to death by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being in want, distressed, afflicted, of whom the world was not worthy. This same type of thing has been renewed in our own day in Russia and Mexico. And St Paul concludes, And therefore let us run by patience to the fight proposed to us, looking on Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who, having joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now sitteth on the right hand of the throne of God. In his commentary on the Epistle to the Hebrews, St Thomas Aquinas, carried away by the word of God and raised to the contemplation of this mystery, tells us, Consider Christ who bore such contradiction on the part of sinners, and in no matter what tribulation, you will find the remedy in the cross of Jesus. 
you will find in it the example of all the virtues. As St Gregory the Great says, if we recall the passion of our Saviour, there is nothing so hard and so painful that we cannot bear it with patience and love. The more the spirit of faith grows in us, the more we grasp the sense of the mystery of Christ who came into this world for our salvation. That we may have this understanding, the Church, our Mother, places daily before our eyes at the end of Mass the prologue of the Gospel of St John, which contains the synthesis of what Revelation teaches about the mystery of Christ. Let us nourish our souls daily with this sublime page which we shall never sufficiently penetrate. It recalls to us the three births of the Word, his eternal birth, his temporal birth according to the flesh, and his spiritual birth in souls. It is a summary of what is loftiest in the four Gospels. In this summary of Christian faith, we have, first of all, the eternal birth of the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have here a clear statement of the consubstantiality of the Word. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Thus light is thrown on the loftiest words of the Messianic Psalms. The Lord hath said to me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Today in the unique instant of immobile eternity. For to which of the angels, St Paul asks, hath he said at any time, Thou art my Son, today have I begotten thee. The word, Splendour of the Father, is infinitely above all creatures whom he created and preserves. We should also nourish our souls with what is said in the same prologue about the temporal birth of the Son of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as it were of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This temporal birth of Christ is a realisation of all the messianic prophecies and a source of all the graces that men will receive until the end of the world. Lastly, we should live by what this same prologue tells us of the spiritual birth of the Word in our souls. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, he gave them power to be made the sons of God, to them that believe in his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He gave them to become children of God by adoption, as he is the Son of God by nature. Our sonship is a figure of his, for we read in the same chapter, and of his fullness we all have received, and grace for grace. To show us how he wishes to live in us, the Son of God says to us, If anyone love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him, and will make our abode with him. It is not only the created gift of grace that will come, it is the divine persons, the Father, the Son, and also the Holy Ghost, promised by the Saviour to his disciples. Instead of daily reciting the Credo and the Gloria in a mechanical manner, instead of almost mechanically saying the prologue of the fourth gospel, we should live more profoundly by this very substantial abridgment of divine revelation. The spirit of faith should thus, while growing, normally give us in ever greater measure the meaning of the mystery of Christ, his supernatural meaning, 
that should gradually become penetrating and sweet contemplation, the source of peace and joy. According to St. Paul's words, Rejoice in the Lord always, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.